Welcome to Mexico Matters, the CSIS podcast about how events occurring in Mexico can impact and more importantly, matter in the United States. I am Mariana Campero, non-resident senior associate of the Americas program at CSIS and the former CEO of the Mexican Council on Foreign Relations, COMEXI. According to the State Department, in 2022, there were 1.6 million U.S. citizens living in Mexico. Contrary to public perception, very few of which are retirees, and the numbers keep growing. In fact, in 2022, there were 70% more Americans than before the pandemic. And to speak with us about what is motivating thousands, not only of Americans, but also people from all over the world to migrate to Mexico and what it is like to live, work, or own a business, that it is my pleasure to welcome Travis and Tamana Bembenek, owners of the Mexico News Daily, a growing English language Mexican newspaper. Travis, Tamana, welcome to Mexico Matters. We know thousands of stories of Mexican migrants moving to the U.S., both legally and illegally, and how their presence is impacting local communities. In fact, I am one of them. I am a legal migrant in the United States. However, very few people know about the other side of that coin, right? That is, what is the story of the millions of Americans living in Mexico? Travis, Tamana, could you please tell us a little bit about what is called the American diaspora and what motivated you to migrate a few years ago? First of all, thank you, Mariana, for having us on the podcast. We truly appreciate it. Maybe I'll just answer the second question first and then go into your first question. To start with, I'll tell you a little bit of my story. I, Travis and I both have stories, uh, respective stories in terms of how we decided to migrate. And the funny thing is, I've been an immigrant twice in this regard. I was born in India, migrated to the U.S., and then, of course, now being an immigrant here in Mexico. But, you know, when the pandemic hit four years ago, the pandemic provided me kind of the space to reevaluate my life. And for me, it was really much needed. My work life was intense. I loved my work, but I was working for a multinational European company, lots of travel, one could say my life was pretty hyper-efficient, but I was also pretty burned out by that. Later, of course, I realized that efficiency has a price. So I knew that it was time to really make a change. And for me, that really meant that it was time to get uncomfortable. And Mexico has always been my favorite place to vacation and also to explore. So during the pandemic, we started spending a lot of time in Mexico, but also I am a geek I love learning, and of course, I also love working, but I wanted to do something that was rewarding for me and also allowed me to give back. And so Travis and I, while we spent time in Mexico, started discussing kind of what kind of challenge did we want to take on, because I really did want to keep learning, do problem solving, and that's how kind of we came on to Mexico News Daily. Maybe, Travis, you want to jump in and... Yeah, I mean, I think so, as you can tell from Tamana's story, the motivations of, of each of the, the immigrants coming to Mexico are, are different and unique. As Mariana, you said, there's 1.6 million. I've heard numbers as high as 2 million. Right, but I think it's sort of hard to really pin it down, right? It is, it is. And so I think one of the, the interesting things we've observed uh, over the years of, of spending time in Mexico, and, and especially recently, is how the motivations of the immigrants seem to be expanding. So whereas I would say, you know, maybe 10 years ago, a lot of the motivation was a lower cost of living, great weather, and potentially a nice place to have a second home or to retire. Over the last few years, and it was happening before the pandemic, but I think it's accelerated during the pandemic and afterwards, is really people coming for a lot of different reasons. So we see families coming more and more often, coming here because they're looking for a different experience for, to raise their children. We see digital nomads, younger people coming either to work remote or to start their own business and be entrepreneurs in Mexico. And then of course we see an increasing flow 
of, of people coming to retire either early or retire kind of at the, the normal retirement age or just to have a second home. Travis, I read that only about 3 to 6% of Americans living in Mexico receive a social security check. So in fact, contrary to public perception, only very few are retirees. And as your story indicates, people are coming for different reasons, right? A lot of them are coming in search of a better quality of life, but also, as you guys, people are, are coming for business opportunity. What is really the profile of this American diaspora? That's, that's a great observation and great question. And, and again, I think it's, it's really changing and evolving. So Taman and I do spend a lot of time traveling throughout the country. We live in the middle of the country in a, in a little town called San Miguel de Allende right now. Yeah, gorgeous. And, <laughs> and what we see is that whether it's the beach communities of the Pacific coast, the beach communities of, of the Caribbean, the big cities in the center part of the country, uh, people really are coming, like you say, much more than in the past, not to retire, but to start a new chapter in life, right? And, and that's what Tamana talked about at the beginning. They're coming, again, to start a business, to try something new, to follow that passion in art or writing or photography that they've always dreamed of. You just spoke about digital nomads or remote workers. Since the pandemic, Mexico certainly became one of the most popular destinations for this cohort. But they have a very different budget, and they're certainly impacting prices of rents, restaurants, and other cultural elements. In fact, it's really interesting because walking around certain neighborhoods or cities in Mexico, you can hear English or French or Italian, Indian, and even Chinese. That is really cool, but it also comes at a cost, right? How is this gentrification being received by locals? Well, actually, Taman and I just a couple of days ago were walking around Condesa and La Roma. So we saw and heard firsthand what you're talking about. And like you say, it's not just English that you hear. You really do see and hear people from all over the world now coming to Mexico. And I think to answer your question specifically of how that's being received by the locals, I think as as in any case where there's a large influx of a population coming into an area there's good and bad right so much is written in texas about all the californians moving in and and the, the good and bad that comes with that especially austin exactly you think of a city like austin that's written about a lot and the impact so i think it, it varies based on the community yeah, in mexico yeah. where we are in san miguel de allende there's a long history of immigration of, of Americans and, and Canadians and others coming to the city and contributing. Yeah, and contributing. I mean, San Miguel has a very long history of Americans contributing in making really San Miguel a better place. For sure. And so I think here, you know, there's a great example in this city of, of immigrants really truly trying to be, I guess I'd say in quotes, good immigrants. And what I mean by that is, is people who, who truly try to respect and understand the community that they've moved into. There's a, there's a great degree of integration in this community between not only the, the locals who were born and raised here, but also other Mexicans moving from other cities to this, this community. And then obviously the, the foreign community. Not easy to afford, however. No, and, and that is an issue. You know, and going back to your comment about Condesa and, and Roma and, and some of those neighborhoods, affordability and housing is definitely an issue, and as it is in, in many major cities, right, throughout North America. And, and the immigration from other countries into those neighborhoods was exacerbating that problem. There's no, there's no denying that. But I think at the end of the day, when you look at the economic vitality going on in those communities. You know, it, we, we go there quite frequently. We like walking around and you see new businesses popping up. Uh, you see, a, you know, just a, more people than ever sort of out and about and, and enjoying the city. And so I think there are positives to it as well when it's, when it's thoughtful. And, and I think especially when the immigrants really take the time to understand 
the community that they've been they've they've moved into the issues that the community and the people have and you know and try to try to integrate as much as possible if i remember correctly you bought mexico news daily a few years ago and mexico news daily is an english language newspaper based in mexico but according to the 2022 doing business report Mexico usually scores in the 70s out of 100 for doing business. What has been your experience as a small business owner in Mexico? So we've owned Mexico News Daily just for about a year and a half now. My experience before that was over 25 years of, of doing business on a, with a multinational large companies in Mexico. So I'll just answer it kind of in, in both ways as a, as, as a multinational we always found Mexico to be one of our best markets, whether it's, you know, the GDP growth or the, the proximity to large markets like the U.S., relatively stable inflation, a great workforce, young workforce. As a multinational, Mexico was consistently one of our highest performing markets in terms of revenue and profit growth. As an entrepreneur and a small business owner, it's been a different experience for us. Um, you know, I speak the language. I, I understand the country well in terms of, of labor and, and legal and, and finance issues. But when you're not doing it as part of a large company, but your own small company, it's trickier, right? And I, and I guess I would say to anyone thinking of doing that, it's very important to have some accounting and some legal help locally. Right. What have been your, your biggest challenges, would you say, as a small business owner? Because, it, you know, Luis de la Calle recently published a book about, you know, one of the ch biggest challenges for small business owners, and it's extortion. I hope you guys have not encountered that, but what have been your biggest challenges? For me, it's a little bit of a, uh, two things. One is that we're, first, we're also an uh, entrepreneur for the first time here in Mexico. And so that brings out a different challenge on its own. In addition to being in Mexico, this is small business, we're entrepreneurs, we're figuring things out. But one of the bigger challenges at least that I see for M&D has been talent. Getting the right talent as a small business to try to really make sure that we grow to scale. Yeah, I mean, we're a digital platform, so we have some pretty special, unique skills that are needed. Oftentimes, we can't find them locally in our little town here of San Miguel. Right. But when we look broader, because we're digital, we're able to find them. But again, as Tamana said, being a smaller business, you don't necessarily have the, the economic resources to go out there and, and, and get the top talent or find the top talent as easily as when you're part of a multinational. It is very interesting that you guys see talent as one of the biggest challenges I have spoken with other businessmen, particularly those in the tech sector, who have also expressed the exact same concern. And they, they have told me that the Mexican government really needs to expedite the work visas to make it easier for companies to bring workers from other parts of the world in order to allow this entrepreneurial ecosystem to flourish. Tamana, Travis, what has been your experience? Was it easy for you to get a residency or a working visa? Sure. So I'll, again, I'll address that as us as entrepreneurs, we have not had to bring anyone to Mexico to work. We do have employees and contractors in 13 different states of Mexico and seven different countries, but we haven't had to actually physically bring anyone here. When I was working for larger companies, we would frequently move people from other countries to Mexico. It historically has not been an easy process. It takes as long as six months or more to make it happen. And actually in our reporting that we do with different companies growing and investing in Mexico, we do hear that as an issue. This week we're highlighting Indian companies in the IT industry that, that are investing in Mexico. And they have talked to us at length about how they really need accelerated visa processes to get employees and to get managers and to get people that can train local employees Especially over here for quickly. Technical jobs. Especially for technical positions. Yeah. You know, we got our permanent residency visas early on in the pandemic. And so for us, it was a very quick 
probably two month process for us to, to do that. It was easy and quick. Our understanding and in, in talking to friends is that it, it, it is not it as quick or quite easy. A bit. Yeah. Right. There's been huge demand and, and the process has slowed down a bit as of late. We were sort of early movers <laughs> in that regard. Exactly. God, you were certainly lucky to get it that fast. And we can only hope that the next administration will understand the importance and the opportunity for Mexico to be able to attract this type of talent. Tamana, Travis, let me move into a, maybe a sensitive question. You bought an English-speaking newspaper at a time in which the industry is going through a big transformation. Moreover, in a country in which practicing independent journalism often amounts to a death sentence, in 2022 alone, a journalist was attacked every 13 hours, and the government of Mexico has failed to ensure security for reporters. Not only that, in fact, President López Obrador himself is known for insulting and defaming independent journalists. Are you at all concerned about your own security and that of your reporters? It's a good question. It's something we think about very frequently. You know, we cover in our newspaper a lot of these incidents or, or terrible crimes against journalists, so we're very aware of it. That being said, we take some real steps within our team to make sure we don't have to lose sleep about this issue. And, and we do a couple things, and, and I think the first thing that's important is we try to just report on the news. So many times today you see the media mixing opinions and news. And I think that's where you can enter a little bit of a danger zone. If you're, instead of just presenting the news as it's happening and what was said by politicians, when you start mixing in too much your own opinions. So we really do separate and I think that's, that's very unique in the media today. We separate the news from opinions. But I would also add that I think that we very early on spend a lot of time understanding our own value proposition to our readers and understanding what our readers are looking for. So we spent time, did market research, and we really were clear that we were not going to do investigative journalism. And one of the reasons being is that we feel that People are inundated with information today. And so the priority really for us is really connecting the dots for people so that they can digest the news properly and they can use the news to make educated, informed decisions for themselves. And so to Travis's point, we really try in our value proposition to make sure that the news, opinions, and analysis are three separate things that we offer. Give me an example so that I, I can understand what do you have to do to report the news while at the same time don't step into dangerous territory, could you? Sure. So, I mean, I think a, a common example that's in the news on an unfortunate daily basis in Mexico is the cartels, right? The, anything related to drug trafficking. So there's different ways to cover what's going on, right? And and I think, as Tamana was saying, we, we avoid what's referred to as investigative journalism. So we're not going to have people out on the street trying to get to the bottom of a story in that type of content. We just think that the risk is too high. But we will cover things that the U.S. government is doing to try to improve the situation, the Mexican government, the dialogue that the governments are having new developments in terms of investments in, in police force or ways to minimize. We just had an article yesterday about a, a big drug bust that took place. So we do cover it, but just like Tamana said, we don't cover it from a trying to expose or uncover the unknown story. And again, we do that out of protection for our people. And also, I, I would say, Mariana, just from my own, a little bit of my experience being Indian, growing up in India, I often saw like news outlets like BBC, for example, cover certain topics about India. But India was changing and has been changing for past 40 years or 50 years. And so those topics weren't covered. And so our focus really has been kind of to give a 360 view 
of how Mexico is changing. And of course there are negatives, but of course there are also many more positives. So to give that neutral sort of balanced view is what we focus on. Before we move into other subjects and try to give a more balanced view, Tamana, which I fully agree, let me just ask you about the upcoming elections, which in fact will be the largest elections in Mexico's history. As you know, Mexico will be electing not only the president, but also the two chambers, six governors, the mayor, and thousands of other local positions. And as you know, political violence usually surges around the election season in Mexico. Dozens of politicians and candidates were killed prior to the midterm elections in 2021. And unfortunately, it's starting to happen again. Just a few days ago, two candidates for mayor were killed. What will be your strategy? Starting with the presidential elections, there's three main candidates running right now. And what we try to do, again, keeping in mind who our, our customer and our reader is, is we're trying to educate and inform our readers about where these candidates stand on different positions, right? So we really try to keep it at that level of what are they talking about? What do they want to do differently if they become president? And, 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 and we do that because, again, through conversations and, and research into what our readers are looking for and, and what they want to learn them. and how it impacts them, it's those types of issues. So we don't, we don't get into the daily back and forth between the politicians. Obviously, they, they attack one another verbally or they criticize each other. That is just not sort of the level of detail we get into with our readers. And as far as sort of the next layers of elections, so governors and mayors, those tend to be more local. So we cover some of the key ones, the key states or the key, the key elections, but we tend to not get into the details of those more local elections, again, because our readership is looking more for you know, broader coverage of what's going on in the country. But it's a great question, Mariana, because we spent a lot of time thinking about it early on to say that, what do we cover and what do we not cover? And having both, both of us have done marketing before and having done that and understanding who our truly our customer is and where they are located, what do they care about? What impacts them? That is what has truly led us to focus on things that they care about. How do we inform them in a way that helps them either they're, if they're visiting, working, investing, or living in Mexico. If you can imagine, I mean, there's fatigue on reading about politics in Everywhere. the United States if you're an American. And so if you think about it, if there's fatigue about the United States elections by a lot of readers, we have to be very careful about what we're going to show and, and present our readers regarding elections and politics in another country or they're just not going to be interested, right? So we're, we're very thoughtful about that. As you said, Tamana, despite what we read in the press, the story of Mexico is certainly not only one of violence. In fact, you guys are a very good example of something bigger that is also happening. Mexico received $29 billion in foreign direct investments just in the first half of last year. And companies from all over the world are looking either to start or expand the business in Mexico. We are the 15th largest economy in the world, but we're right next to the largest economy, the United States. So, Travis, what are you seeing and other business people you talk to seeing in Mexico? Sure. So uh, another great question. You know, I, I first came to Mexico almost 30 years ago during college because I saw the opportunity with NAFTA, right? It was a time where the free trade agreement was being signed between the US, Canada, and Mexico. And it was really an exciting time to be studying business and, and seeing the opportunity between the countries. Unfortunately for Mexico, and I think for North America in general, we saw a huge amount of the potential that could have happened in Mexico go to China, right? And, and throughout Asia. And so right now, I think 30 years later, we're at an opportunity and, and, and I think many people are seeing it as a, a once in a generation or a historic opportunity where a huge amount of that investment is now coming back 
to North America. People call it friendshoring, people call it nearshoring, deglobalization, but there's no doubt when you talk to business people throughout the country, there is a major excitement about this trend happening. Absolutely. Last week, Taman and I attended the annual meeting of the U.S. American Chamber of Commerce of Mexico, and the excitement was, was very palatable. People are excited about the investment, about the opportunity uh, in the business sector, and it's not just on the border. The governor of Nuevo Leon, Samuel Garcia, spoke at the event. He's obviously excited about all the investment taking place in his state and, and being geographically close to the United States and Texas. He has you know, great opportunities there, but it's happening everywhere in the country. And it's not just happening in the manufacturing sector. If you go to... I mean, the tech you know, companies that we're interviewing are talking about just the investment that is happening in technology. And by that, I mean like IT consulting in various different segments, but including med tech as well. And of course, the semiconductor industry, energy sector, for example, we hear about that as well. Yeah, and, and I mean, even cities like Guadalajara, not anywhere near the border, are booming from technology opportunities and IT investment. Querétaro, another city in the center of the country near where we live, is absolutely booming and it's becoming the data center capital of Mexico and Latin America. And just, Amazon. just two weeks ago, yeah. Amazon announced, uh, Amazon Web Services, a $5 billion investment in data center. And then even if you get outside of manufacturing and IT, and go to states like Oaxaca or Yucatan or Quintana Roo, investments continue to happen and, and accelerate in the tourism sector, in the housing sector. There's this trans-peninsular train investment that is a potentially an alternative to the Panama Canal that's happening in Southern Mexico, and that's attracting investment. So um, it, it's an absolutely exciting time across industries and across the country for people doing business in, in Mexico. Yeah, as one of your founding fathers said, if we can keep it, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. exactly. Well, Tamana, Travis, unfortunately, we have come to the end of this episode and really very interesting conversation. I wish you the very best of luck in your new business. As I told you, I am a fan, so congratulations. Thank you so, so much for participating in Mexico Matters. We so appreciate you being a reader. Thank you so much, Mariana. Thank you. If you enjoyed this podcast, check out our larger suite of CSIS podcasts from Into Africa, The Asia Chessboard, China Power, AIDS 2020, The Trade Guys, Smart Women, Smart Power, and more. You can listen to them all on major streaming platforms like iTunes and Spotify. Visit csis.org slash podcasts to see our full catalog 